Welcome to the CV Debeck Education with another critical topic in cardiovascular perfusion. Today we will explore practical strategies for determining the required blood flow, selecting the appropriate cannula and managing pressure flow dynamics in CPB. One of the most important things we do as perfusionists during CPB is determine the appropriate blood flow rate. This isn't just about running the pump, it's about ensuring we deliver enough oxygen to the patient's tissues. Blood flow also plays a role in determining factors such as uh, drug dosing, evaluating metabolic needs and selecting the appropriate cannula. To determine the flow, we use the cardiac index which represents the blood flow per square meters of body surface area, the BSA. Typically, the cardiac index ranges from about 2.2 to 3 liters per meter per square meter. We multiply this by the patient's body surface area to determine their individualized target flow. The exact value we choose within that range depends on the clinical situation. For example, a patient with a hypothermic temperature or low metabolic demand may require less flow, while others may need more support. It's essential to recognize that this calculation serves as a starting point. The flow is constantly adjusted during bypass to meet the patient's metabolic demands always staying within safe limits for the circuit and cannulas. Now, selecting the right arterial and venous cannula is just as important as calculating the flow itself. The goal is to achieve the necessary flow rates while minimizing complications like hemolysis, turbulence or excessive pressure drops across the circuit. There are several keys uh, factors uh, uh, we need to consider when choosing a cannula. First, there is the, the flow rate. For adults, the typical flow rate ranges from 2 to 5 liters per meter or more, depending on the patient's size and the type of procedure being performed. Next uh, is the pressure. High pressures across the cannula can damage red blood cells or even worse, uh, can cause damage to the intimal layer of the aorta, provoking dissection. So we always say to deliver uh, the necessary flow at the lowest safe pressure. Then we have size, which is measured in French, where one French uh, equals one third of uh, a millimeter. Larger cannulas can support uh, higher flows, but if the flow is too high for the size of the cannula, it can lead to turbulence flow with increase the risk of hemolysis. And we also have to consider blood viscosity, which can change due to hypothermia, anemia, or dehydration. Increased viscosity makes blood flow more difficult, resulting in greater resistance and potentially higher pressure across the cannula. And uh, another concept uh, uh, we use uh, is the renal numbers. Uh, which helps us to determine whether the flow is laminar, turbulent or transitional. All right, let's take a closer look at flow dynamics, cannula selection and how we manage blood parameters during CPB. This is a key concept in fluid dynamics. The renal number is a dimensionless value that helps us predict whether blood flow through a cannula will be laminar, turbulent or somewhere in between. A low renal number, say below 2000, we see laminar flow. The blood moves in a smooth, orderly layers with minimal disturbance. This is great for reducing shear stress uh, on red blood cells. However, uh, the downside is uh, that laminar flow isn't always efficient uh, when high flow rates are required, such as during bypass. On the other hand, uh, if the renal numbers goes above to 4000, the flow becomes turbulent. Now the blood is moving chaotically uh, with a lot of mixing. That can be useful in some cases, for example, improving oxygen exchange, but it also increases shear forces, uh, which raises the risk of hemolysis and cloth formation. 
So, what's the sweet spot? For CPB, we typically aim for a transitional flow characterized by uh, a renal numbers between 2000 and 4000. This provides a good balance, efficient blood flow with minimal damage to cells. Now, how do we calculate it? The formula is uh, velocity by diameter divide kinematic viscosity and because blood viscosity changes with temperature we must consider the patient's temperature during bypass cooler blood is thicker which affects uh, flow resistance so it's always part of our consideration let's shift to something more practical pressure flow relationships and how this helps to choose the right uh, cannula we use pressure flow charts to visualize how much pressure is needed to achieve a specific flow rate through a given cannula. You'll typically see flow rate on the x-axis in liter per minute, pressure on the y-axis in millimeter of mercury. When selecting arterial cannulas, we aim for the smallest size that uh, we can deliver the necessary flow rate uh, with a pressure drop under 100 mm of mercury. For venous cannulas, the target is 140 mm of mercury. Let's say we have a patient who needs 6 liters per minute of flow. If a 21 French arterial cannula gives us a pressure drop of 130 mm of mercury, that's too high. A 24 French cannula would be better. It handle that flow with less resistance and stay within a safe pressure range. It's also important to keep in mind that pressure flow charts are often based on water, not blood. Since blood is more viscous, uh, the actual pressure drop will be higher than what the chart suggests. That's why we usually select a slightly larger cannula uh, that uh, uh, what the chart uh, alone would recommend. Cannula performance uh, also varies between manufacturers. Flow characteristics are be, um, can be different even if the size are labeled the same. So it's always important to consult the manufacturer's flow data when selecting a cannula for a specific use. Now let's quickly touch on the CPB circuit. The circuit must handle the patient's circulatory volume while minimizing resistance and pressure loss. For adults, we typically use tubing sizes like 1 4, 3 8 or 1 half, depending on the expected flow rates. For pediatrics, the, the, the tubing is smaller, I mean 1 8 to 1 4 to match their lower blood volume and avoid excessive resistance. And remember, always check circuit component compatibility. I mean, tubing, oxygenators, cannula, everything needs to, to, to match up uh, all the connections. Let's take a moment to look at the key features that differentiate CPB oxygenators across the market. It's important to know that they are not interchangeable, even if they are all designed to do the same core job. Starting with the membrane material, most CPB oxygenators use uh, microporous hollow fiber membranes, which are effective for short-term procedures. However, some oxygenators, especially those designed for ECMO, use plasma type PMP fibers, uh, polypentene maintainer, which can function safely for days instead of hours. So the membrane material directly determines whether an oxygenator is suited for bypass or long-term extracorporeal uh, support. We have the type of coating. Every manufacturer applies a different kind of biocompatible coating to the blood content surfaces. Standard options include uh, phosphoricoline, heparin-based coatings, or proprietary blends such as uh, terumos is coating. These coatings reduce blood activation inf and uh, inflammation, helping uh, minimize complications during bypass. 
We also distinguish oxygenators by their target patient size. Pediatric and neonatal models are built with lower priming volumes and smaller surface area to prevent excessive hemodilution, while adult oxygenators uh, prioritize higher flow capacity. When discussing component integration, it's essential to note that some oxygenators come equipped with uh, built-in arterial filters and venous reservoirs, thereby simplifying circuit setup and enhancing her handling efficiency. This uh, integrated design are became increasingly common as we strive to simplify configuration and to improve her removal. Another essential factor is the duration of use. CPB oxygenators are typically designed for use of six hours or less, while HECMO capable models uh, can be used for five to 15 days, depending on the fiber material or durability. And finally, we examine gas exchange efficiency, which is particularly crucial in uh, adult cases where maintaining uh, adequate uh, oxygen transfer at high flow rates is essential. This table outlines the general guidelines based on patient categories, neonatal, pediatric and adult. For example, neonatal patients with a body surface area of less than 0.5 square meters typically require flows of under 2 liters per minute and uh, a small membrane surface area, usually around 0.25 square meters is sufficient. These oxygenators also have a very low priming volume, which is essential for minimize hemodilution. As we move to pediatric patients, both the BSA and flow needs increase. Pediatric oxygenators support flows of uh, up to 4.5 liters per minute and usually have a membrane surface area ranging from uh, 0.5 to 1 square meters. The prime volume becomes a balancing uh, act here. It needs to be sufficient to support circulation without causing excessive dilution. For adult patients, the oxygenator must, must support uh, higher flows, often uh, above 5 liters per minute, and provide sufficient oxygen transfer, typically in the range of uh, uh, 150 to 2,250 millimeter per minute. These oxygenators have a larger surface area and uh, higher prime volume, which is acceptable given uh, the patient's overall blood volume. It's also important to consider the oxygenator's resistance to flow and gas exchange capacity. Always ensure the model you choose can deliver the necessary oxygen and remove uh, enough carbon dioxide for the specific patient, especially during long or complex bypass procedures. Finally, always cross-reference uh, with the manufacturer's specs uh, to confirm you are within safe and effective operating ranges. Now let's walk through a quick calculation for hematocrit uh, on uh, bypass. Start by estimating total blood volume. Is the patient weight in kilogram by 70? Then calculate uh, the total red blood cell volume using pre-bypass hematocrit. Add in your priming volume, uh, say, uh, 1200 and now divide uh, TRBCV by total volume to estimate it hematocrit bone bypass. So after going on pump the hematocrit would drop to about 27% due to dilution. Speaking of priming volumes, uh, this, uh, uh, this is another key factor to manage. For adults, the circuit usually holds between 1 and 1.5 liters. For smaller patients, priming volumes range from 250 to 800 milliliter. 
The goal is to keep this volume as low as possible to reduce uh, hemodilution. That's why it's important to know these values. In summary, uh, achieving the correct blood flow on bypass isn't just about a number. It's about balancing cardiac index, body surface area, cannula choice, uh, and circuit design. Uh, so quick ref reference methods are helpful, but uh, understanding flow dynamics, uh, pressure for relationships, and tubing selection is what ensures uh, safe and effective perfusion. So by mastering these principles, we not only optimize patients' outcomes, but we keep perfusion safe and stable and responsive during every case. Thank you for your attention.